Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, fellow Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 62 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jim the Knife Newbie Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco the Knife Junkie. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's the place for knife newbies like myself and knife junkies like you to learn about knives and knife collecting, hear from uh, knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anyone who loves knives. That's what we do here on the weekend edition of the Knife Junkie Podcast, where we have an interview and we talk to someone in the knife industry. And Bob, this show this week and show last week Mm -hmm. are the first two shows we've had that we've actually had female interviewees which i find just just awesome yeah me too me too it's a it's a great uh it's a great change uh, this seems to be a male dominated industry mm-hmm. i know all of uh, my viewers on youtube seem to be male and that's great that's all good but uh you know i know there are some knife junkets out there <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we want to bring more of them into the conversation too right yeah stacy uh, uh jennings last week with um Douglas attention Esposito, to Attention to Detail Mercantile. and uh, But this week, uh, Marianne Halpern, Three Rivers Manufacturing, the whole interview is her. So uh, uh, what what was your uh, kind of thought process going into to talking to Marianne with Three Rivers? Well, I got to say, I was uh, very interested to talk to her because the knives, uh, the Three Rivers Manufacturing knives kind of came quietly onto the scene. Quietly, yet they made quite a ripple uh, with knife critics on YouTube. Their knives are... And I mean this in the best of ways. Their knives are understated and they are high performers. By understated, I mean they, they're not big, flashy, crazy designs. They're simple, beautiful, you know, uh, timeless designs. And from everything I've heard from my favorite knife critics and others, uh, online, they are fantastic performers. Now, uh, recently, Pete from Cedric and Ada channel, and uh, also uh, Slicey Dicey, Brian from Slicey Dicey, have both alluded to the fact that the TRM, the Three Rivers Manufacturing Atom, which is the uh, three and a half inch, the larger bladed knife, is their kind of desert island knife. You know, they mm-hmm. uh, Brian from Slicey Dicey went through this big process of what his, uh, he has a great video up right now, what his favorite knife of 2019 was. And he had all these fantastic knives. I think he had 12 out on his, uh, on his reviewing mat. And he sort of just, uh, would pick a knife up, sing its praises, and then eliminate it. And he got all the way down to the TRM Atom. And for good reason, it's thin, slicey, strong, beautiful, made of awesome materials. Hmm. And, uh, Pete from Cedric and Ada, from all of his testing, you know, he does all this bro science testing where he cuts ropes and slices paper and counts and, <laughs> he does a lot of uh, interesting testing. He came to the conclusion that the Atom is his favorite folding knife uh, mm-hmm. recently. He's been on the show, too. He's an awesome right. guy. Well, that interview is coming up next, but I do want to remind you that our uh, sponsor for today's podcast is QuickBooks. They have an annual event called QuickBooks Connect. It's their annual conference that took place in early November. If you were able to be there, well, that's great. I know I'd love to go to uh, uh, San Jose uh, in, in the winter time here for me in the East Coast. But anyway, they made several announcements at uh, QuickBooks Live, which uh, is going to uh, help. Uh, they've got a team of virtual bookkeepers who you can trust to help get your books done right. Another exciting announcement was what they call Cash Flow Planner. This feature uses AI to address the cash flow stress that affects many small business owners and allows you as a small business owner to predict your daily cash flow 90 days in the future so that you can make plans like delaying paying a bill or requesting invoices to be paid faster, that type of thing. And another exciting feature is QuickBooks Payments, which is um, helping you to get paid faster. We all know how important it is to get money in your pocket, so QuickBooks launched this feature to create a payment-enabled invoice in less than a minute. So with hours, expenses, and mileage added by AI automatically, it's proven to help small business owners get paid three times faster. So if you want to learn any about these features or QuickBooks, you can find out and get a 30-day free trial of QuickBooks for your business 
at theknifejunkie.com slash QB30. That's theknifejunkie.com slash QB30. Jim, I think I could use some artificial intelligence in my <laughs> finances because my uh, organic intelligence isn't doing the trick. <laughs> some kind of intelligence is always <laughs> helpful. <laughs> Just any kind. For you and me, both. <laughs> Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. I'm here with Marianne Halpern of Three Rivers Manufacturing. Marianne, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bob. This is my first podcast, and I hear you're going to make me very relaxed. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's all good. You know what we're going to do? We're just going to sit here and we're going to talk about knives for a while. Something I pretend to know about, but something you actually really know about. So, um, Three Rivers Manufacturing, also known as TRM, you started out in the titanium supply business. Tell me about that. Actually, in 1997, we started out with a supply business for custom knife makers. Our original name was actually Custom Knife Supply or something like that. Um, I think I have some business cards that say that. And Les was a hobbyist knife maker, and he needed to have screws that you couldn't just go to Rockies and get. And he convinced me that he found a company in Chicago that would sell him screws by the thousand, and he needed about ten different ones. So he convinced me that if he wanted them, there must be other knife makers that want them, that will put a hundred in envelopes and send them out, and checks will come in. And that's how we started in 1997. Uh, then we continued... Uh, besides the screws, we had carbon fiber and G10, titanium, all things that he wanted. So he convinced <laughs> me that with our initial investment of $2,000 that we started uh, Custom Knife Supply. And about two, about two years in, we thought we needed a stronger name. So we sat and with the person designing our business card and she said, what, well, what else do you sell? And we said titanium. So we became Halpern and Titanium. And the rest is history. So Almost uh, almost 23 years ago, we started, and it's always been with the custom knife customers and the factories. Uh, about 95% of our business is still knife making. So how did this, uh, tell me about this evolution from just supplying the uh, small custom knife makers with the kind of specialized materials they wanted to manufacturing and designing your own line of knives? It's a, it's a long story. I'll give you the short short version. No, no, no. Uh, I want to hear the long story. <laughs> uh, once we started selling G10, which we think is the best uh, in the world, we started selling it to the custom makers who then showed it to the uh, factories that they started designing knives for, and they wanted to know where they got that. And we started shipping G10 and carbon fiber around the world. And then the different knife makers uh, started designing knives for companies and Pretty soon, we started making parts for them. We didn't even have a CNC machine yet. We had people making it for us. And in 1999, we bought our first uh, CNC mill. And then we bought another one. And now we have about 25 machines. Wow. Uh, so we just kept moving, taking risks. Anytime you're in business, you're always just out of your comfort zone. Um, we thought two was just great. We made some money, and let's just stay like that. But the, as the market changed, we kept going with it and adding machinery and it just kept evolving until about five or six years ago, we decided maybe we'll do some of our own brand because we do OEM products and certainly um, I can't release those names and mm -hmm. anyone that comes to our shop, we tell them that if we ever hear anything from them, that we're going to have to kill them. So that's basically, <laughs> um, some people do know some things, but we've got some great people that know that they better keep it under their hat because that's what's made our business, that people don't know what we do. When we first started Three Rivers, I really tried to make that connection with Halpern because we did know a lot about knives. We've made thousands and thousands of knives. But a couple of years ago, I realized that a lot of new customers don't really want to know about Halpern or it doesn't really matter that much. So I just use that as that we know that we have great experience. We know a lot about knives. We know what our customers like. We have phenomenal customer service, um, which we started with Halpern Titanium, word of mouth out of our house. Um, and then it grew thousands of customers. So that's our motto, really, customer service. We're kind of known for over-the-top customer service, and that's what we're going to keep doing. Nice. Well, let, let me back up and ask you before you go on. Um, how did it? How did you go from making parts for people and just supplying materials to actually OEM assembly of makers' knives? 
That's a great question. I've got to try to remember how we did get into that evolution. <laughs> um, I think we started making parts for some custom knife makers, mostly their parts. And to tell you the truth, I'm trying to remember who that first one was. I really don't know. Just It was just all part of the evolution as we kept getting different machines, and then we bought water jets, and then we bought wire EDM, and we got burger grinders. We just kept wow. evolving until we were a, a real bona fide knife factory. And I, to tell you the truth, I do not remember how that very first one started, but it was just really part of that evolution as customers didn't just want parts. They said, hey, maybe you can make the whole knife. And said, All right, maybe we can make the whole knife, and, and off we went. And, and then once one person knows that we do that, then we just kept adding from there. It's always the first one that breaks ground and then off off we go that's been our pattern and i guess just spoke with our uh, staff a couple of days ago and said that les and i are all in we're making a knife company um we didn't ever re- think it would get to this point and quite this fast but the last 18 months have been phenomenal and we're going with it so what was the first knife that you uh put out there and uh what was the philosophy driving it I think the first knife was our Nomad. It was a small slip joint. And it was a design that Les had. Um, I'm not really sure why he started with a slip joint. I think he was always fascinated with the traditional slip joints, and he made a more modern version of one. Um, it was it was successful, but we were still very entrenched in our OEM projects. So it's kind of hard to do. We're still a small company. We have you know have about 20 employees altogether, but we're still not a huge company. So it's hard to do your own products and do OEM and sell material. So our company at that point sort of tech, took second place. So that knife, it had its its uh, a pretty good life, but we didn't really keep going too much after that. We had we did a Bob T collaborative. We mm. did one with R.J. Martin. And the philosophy at that point was that we would do really high-end knife. They would be production knives with working with the uh, designers step-by-step, step, and we would make a couple hundred and be done. Hmm. And we did that with those two knives. You said R.J. Martin and who else? Uh, Bob Terzola. Bob Terzola. So that philosophy, it started out okay, but then it's like you put all this effort into making a couple hundred knives and then you're done. It's not really a great model to go forward. So we, we kind of laid back a little bit for a while and then Les came out with the Atlas, which is a Similar version to the Nomad, but we could we learned how to manufacture a lot less expensively. So we had that about maybe a year and a half ago. That was a good success, but slip joints still have a, you know, they're kind of niche We really look for the mm-hmm. European market, and they're very popular there, but it's not a, your mainstream uh, choice. Somehow we got we stayed on the slip joint thing, unless we made the Viator, which is a larger version. Uh, again, that again is not quite the mainstream knife to have a slip joint. I guess he's on his, he was on a slip joint kick. And we finally <laughs> got him off that. We all go on those. Yeah, we did. Um, I, mean, I like them a lot, but it's not everybody does. The, everyone goes to open that with with uh, one hand, and we tell tell them how they have to open it with two hands at Blade Show, and they, <laughs> and they put it back on the table. So it's kind of good to listen to your people. Right. Uh, so One about, thing I remember about the Viator, sorry to interrupt, no. was uh, everyone mentioned how thin the blade was and how beautifully thinly ground it was and what an amazing slicer. I mean, to me, that was the first, um, that's the first characteristic of a TRM knife that right. pops and out I, at me. Yeah, that's a good point that you brought that up because even though, you know, it's a slip joint, that was kind of the beginning of our, certainly becoming our brand, lightweight. We That one we used, I think it was C- CPU. CPM 154, if I remember correctly, on that one. Uh, no, actually, that was S35VN. Uh, but since then, we've been using 20CV. We're keeping that same 90,000 thickness. People seem to really love that sliciness. All our knives will have some titanium in it, so we're staying with the titanium liners. Mm-hmm. Um, staying with the 20CV steel. Uh, and that lightweight seemed to become our thing, and we like it. And I think the way the Viator was designed, and, and then Neutron which is almost identical, but just in a, a liner lock, is it's a knife. If someone were to draw a picture of a knife, that's what they might draw. It's a <laughs> knife. It's not meant to be scary. It's not a, a weapon, unless it's on Facebook. Um, so we, that sort of became our new, our new thing. This is a knife. It's nice. It's made in the United States. We use carbon fiber, all the best material. We try to use everything U.S. made. We do have custom titanium thumb studs. We make custom pivots and screws. All our hardware is made in the United States. Our carbon, our G10 is U.S. made. 
Um, and we're, we're proud of that, and we're trying to make it at a price point that maybe for your average person that wants to go to Home Depot and buy a $29 knife, it's not inexpensive, but we're keeping all our models um, in the 160 200 range, right. unless they get more elaborate scales, uh, which we are also moving into. So the Neutron, be, just be kind of put us on the map, I guess, in terms of our own knife company. It's it's about, I don't have all my facts and figures in front of me, but it's somewhere around two and a half ounces. And it's, I don't know, three eighths inch thick. I don't have it all in front of me. I didn't bring all my stats with me. But <laughs> you know, with the 20 CV, yeah. uh, it seems to be a very popular steel and we like it. We like it if you like it. Um, <laughs> we have a great uh, heat treater locally, uh, aerospace heat treater. Know, knows how to heat treat that 20 CV just great. And that's kind of become our thing. So the Neutron is a knife that uh, a very popular YouTuber and a, a former guest on this show, Pete from Cedric and Ada Outdoors in Australia, when he got that knife, I remember hearing in his review that he he – would almost th like get rid of the rest of his knives in deference to that one. And just, he, he absolutely loved it. He tested it, uh, doing his uh, usual sort of, he's got this, uh, sort of standardized sisal rope test and it did fantastically. And he just, uh, gushed about that knife. And I have, uh, you know, I, I trust his judgment. Yes. I have not held one yet. I would. Oh, that's not right. No, I agree. <laughs> We're going to have to take care of that for you. Oh, man. I, I love the, that Neutron. I did see Cedric's. Uh, I got some great guys. I have a Facebook group, and every time there's anything out there related to TRM, they let me know. So I got that link, and it's just, he's awesome. It was, yeah. It's almost too much when they start comparing it to $450 knives. It's, oh, boy. Um, but it's been great. We've got a couple other reviewers out there that like us a lot, and uh, we appreciate that. Yeah, but sometimes it's a double-edged sword that everyone wants their knife to be as good. They want to love it as much as Cedric does, and Nick does, and Brian Ball does. Um, so we try to make everyone that goes out the door to, that they're going to like it just as much. Um, that's a that's a high bar, but we like it. We like yeah. it because it's really helped us to develop our business. And when we came out with the Atom. The point with the Atom was that some people said the Neutron was too small. So this was a three and a half inch blade. And then as we were moving along, instead of making it just like the Neutron, we decided to make nested liners, uh, which then made the, the scales a little bit more intricate and kind of gave it a different look. Um, it wasn't that same stacked look as the Neutron. We decided to go with an over the top deep pocket carry clip. Um, we get a lot of requests for that. I'm not sure. I love the Neutron's clip just the way it is, but. We go with what people want. Um, that's what we like. So it ended up when Nick Shabazz grabbed it, he, he started to call it the improved neutron, which wasn't really intent. The intent was just to make a three and a half inch blade. So now we have a neutron, which he loved, knife of the year, and now the improved neutron. So we got a lot of things going on in Three Rivers, uh, but we're, we're real happy. And, and I never, go home without my Neutron unless I can't take his Atom or Nerd away from him. So we all have <laughs> our favorites. And he's got his little fifth pocket Nerd. That's our that's our latest. Wait, wait. We're going to get to the Nerd in a second. But I I think uh, most knife, uh, knife guys, knife people, knife lovers and collectors love what they just heard from you, that you listen to the customer. And, you know, even though you like that, uh, the original clip, people have been asking for... A deep carry clip will give the people what they want. And I think, um, you know, as long as that doesn't compromise the ultimate vision of what you're doing, that's exactly how people really want their knife company to be operating. It's exactly right. There's certain things that some people maybe want the atom to be drop shut. Well, it wasn't designed that way. So there's certain mm -hmm. things that, well, it's not going to be that one. That might not be the knife for you. But things like clips or certain... You know, even when we developed the Nerd, I have a very active Facebook group, and I would put pictures up there, and what do you think about this blade shape, what about that? And I think we got the sixth iteration that became the one that we're actually going to go mm. with. So I actually do input, uh, ask for input. We ask them for what scales they might like. Um, I'll throw up some special scales that I only announce in the Facebook group, and then they grab their purple scales or whatever else I come up with at the time. Um so we have a lot of fun with that group. I, I really encourage people, if they're on Facebook, to join Tycoons Really Matter. It's a great group. It's not really a group to sell. 
it can be, but mostly people put up stories and I have one, one of my greatest customers that fell asleep twice with his Adam. It was so light. It was in his gym shorts and, uh, Oh, Actually, yeah. I went to sleep with it twice, and he let me know that. And another one that dropped his atom off a ladder, and could we fix it? Sure. Sure, we could take care of that for you. So it's just a great group. I, even f- from Instagram and the Facebook group, I've had guys that actually help us out at the shows. Huh. Um, and Chad Watson has, has been fantastic, and he does work for Knives. So we, we have a lot of people that are hoping that maybe we'll pick them next year. But uh, so just some great guys that. That always have my back uh, in the group. It's great. If something goes wrong with a knife, people don't bash anything publicly. They very often will have the respect to let us privately try to work it out. So That's how it should be. Yeah. It's kind of like your neighbor's party. You, you don't call the cops right yeah. away. You right. ask them right. to turn it down. <laughs> well, another thing um, that struck me immediately when, when um, TRM knives came on my radar, uh, which was with the Viator, I believe, uh, was... The modular nature of it, if you want, you can get a, a whole group of different scales and, and keep changing it. And I think you also have maybe uh, pivot collars and just other ways you can customize the knife and make it your own. That we, have, that we haven't done yet with pivot collars. We, just, we are doing it with the scales. And I've actually had customers that have bought scales before they got the knife. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's loyalty. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's also anticipation for for a very cool knife they don't yeah. have yet. A couple of customers have have up to twelve different sets, so that's been that's been kind of fun. We'll, we'll keep doing that, but the the new knife coming out, the the shadow, it, it is going to impact the the uh, mechanisms for that knife. So we're probably not going to offer that. We'll offer it in a few different scale options, but not that you can. We really don't want people to change them and take the knife apart. So if we can't do it without taking the knife apart, we're not going to sell them separately. Oh, right. I, I neglected to, to mention that very uh, unique fact is that not only are your knives um, customizable with all these different scales, but you can t- you can do that without taking the whole knife apart, which right. is uh, which is pretty great. So you were talking about the Nerd. Uh, that's the – you were t- calling it a fifth? pocket knife well yeah well again one of my customers started talking of call it the fifth pocket I, I like it i'm on it that's what we're going to call it the fifth pocket knife yeah it's about i'm trying to think it's about 2.2 inches long and it's going to have 3d contoured scales it is also a liner lock it's going to have a like a mini version of the atom deep pocket carry clip and there's only six out there we sold some prototypes at uh, USN, and then we actually have a, a, a waiting list that's been filled, and that will those should be get shipped in December. So, how does that work? Uh, your waiting lists. Well, what happens is, at one point we had fifty atoms on Blade HQ, and they sold out in three minutes. <laughs> so we we've been having this problem. We're trying to make things as fast as uh, people will buy them, but so far we can't do that. We sold uh, another waiting list of atoms. A few weeks back, that was another three minutes. So I keep putting up waiting lists. Um, we had a long waiting list of 300 at one point, and that, that kind of got confusing because people would change their mind or move or change mm. scales, and the logistics were crazy. So now we've been having shorter waiting lists, about 100 at a time of each of our knives, filling them up and then f- and filling those orders in a reasonable amount of time. We have no intention of having waiting lists that go on for a year. That's really just not... It's too yeah. much stress for everybody. We just want to have a list, and you buy them. You know when you're going to get it, and we keep you updated. I send out a newsletter every two weeks or so to keep people informed on where how we're doing. Um, and right now, we're all over atoms and nerds and neutrons. Uh, we just hired another assembler just today to try to keep up with, uh, keep, keep a nice, even, steady flow of parts coming in and parts going out. Well, so how does it work uh, in terms of, manufacturing a number of different models at once do you do you tool up the shop for one specific knife and bust that out and then retool the shop for something else or how does that work that that would never work what we have right now (laughs) that's why i don't have a knife company (laughs) no what we actually have is neutrons and atoms we probably have 1500 blades at some stage the blades start the path they take the longest from the beginning to end. So we have some blades that are just getting water jet cut. 
We have some blades that are headed to heat treat. We have another group of blades that are going to start getting bevel ground. And then we have some more that are in assembly. So there's this constant flow of parts. Right now we have neutrons and atoms are the most, but there's different levels for all, let's say, probably eight different groups of knives, of blades, just for the atom and the neutron. And the nerd has its own, its own as well. So right now we have pretty pretty wild. I, I am a whiteboard person. I have more whiteboards and trying to figure out what's where and where it's going next and who's going to machine what. But uh, there's a constant flow of, of all different stages. And that's how we're going to keep doing it. We want to get the atom and the neutron nice and smooth, and then we're adding in the nerd. And then about a month or so, we'll start blades for the uh, the shadow. And then we have another fi fifth one that we're no names yet, but soon we'll, we'll release that. Oh, pe people will keep their eye. Uh, tell me, what is the shadow? I have a few pictures we've posted, most of that in Facebook group. I do a lot of works in progress in Facebook group. It seems okay. like Instagram folks like finish knives. They don't really care about <laughs> a part of a knife. They want a whole knife. Right. Um, it is going to use the Benchmade's access lock that's no longer uh, under patent. Okay. We're not really sure what we're going to call it. We don't really want to make a name up. We're probably going to ask Benchmade if we can use that name and, and, and pay them for that, right? To do, we prefer to do it that way to make up some, some uh -huh. new name for what it is what it is. So that's going to have an access lock, and we're kind of excited about that. Tomorrow we're going to get some samples from our custom-made custom, custom made, uh, new wires. Uh, we have a spring company in Connecticut making those for us. We study what possibly uh, people, the only complaint we hear about the access lock is sometimes the wire uh, might break. So what we're going to do is we're going to add one or two, a, a set of wires in with each knife. And we're also working with a spring company in New Britain to try to come up with uh, a way that that's not going to be an issue. You're talking about the Omega Spring? Yes, the Omega Spring. Yeah. I've, I've been hearing about the Omega Spring problem forever. And uh, I just, I, I wonder how much you got to use your knife or in what condition those things snap. And I'm sure they do. I'm not doubting people. Right. But man, either that's a lot of fidgeting or that's a lot of real legitimate work. No, I think it's the, the fidgeting part because <laughs> in my social media experience the last several years, it's, it seems like you sometimes hear more of the problems than someone wrote me one day and he said he's had bench mates for 25 years. He's maybe had one or two break. And I think we're just talking about hundreds of thousands of fidgets and something just might break. We're, we're thinking of possibly, because we like to do weird things, of possibly taking one of our, a few of our protos and sending them out to people and having them fidget a couple hundred times <laughs> and pass it. it on to somebody else fidget a couple hundred more times and see if we could kind of get a little pass around thing going and see if we could get anybody to break it. God, that is brilliant because, you know, I, I, I know that a lot of uh, knife companies send their, their knives out and they tell people, abuse this, put this through, put this through the worst you can. But in reality, the worst is that sort of repetitive stress uh, that it'll go through just from opening and closing it like right. a thousand times a day and channeling your nervous energy there. Yeah, that seemed, that was not a phenomenon when, when we first started. This whole that you have to have it, that it, that you can flick it and you're not going to hurt your finger from the thumb stud after you've flicked it for 200 times. Uh, that didn't used to be an issue. That wasn't typically the part of the design process, but. Right. Well. It, it is. And that's it's what we, we first love. world it's problems, a, right? Got, yeah, it's a hobby and you love them and you collect it and that's our guy. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Actually, I just got a, uh, I, I just got an out the front today, and I haven't stopped. Yeah, you know, I, I, I haven't put it down. Clink, 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 clink. Tell me about your design process. Like, obviously, you're not designing for fidget, but you know, you're you're taking that into account. But where, how do these ideas tell? Explain how they germinate, and then and then the process they go to to actually becoming a production knife. A lot of things, uh, Les has done some things, uh, and other people in-house have given some input into some new knives. Les just spends thousands of hours on his computer and playing and making designs and trying to figure things out. And we've done so many things that we're never going to make. We might even post that we're going to make it and we start making it. It's just, it's just not right. But when we finally get a design that it just seems right, which was well, certainly was the, the Viador shape, which we then turned into the Neutron. The first thing we'll do is, is he'll make a file and send it to our water jet. We have two uh, flow water jets. 
and just cut some parts out. Our water jet is so awesome. The guy that runs is so good. We can actually make parts, cut holes, cut locks, make a D-pivot, and the knife can work as a knife. Wow. So we play with it, make sure we like it, it works right, and then we proceed to start making some blades. And, and off it goes. And in the meantime, we get some input as from our, um, from, from our fans out there, and we sometimes take advice and sometimes not. And that's kind of where we go with it, just that we actually make a knife. And Les can take it from the water jet parts and actually turn it into a functioning knife just on a, on a, uh, on a bridge port. Well, you, you talked before about um, working with Bob Terzuola and R.J. Martin. What What's it like for a company like you who has broken away from OEM work and doing other people's work? You, you've blossomed into this awesome knife company making your own work. What is it like to then collaborate with uh, a legend like either one of those guys? Well, both of those guys are some of our first customers at Halpern Titanium. So we know both of them for 20 years. Right. So it was just a natural progression to, to work with people that we had known so long. So we already knew them. We knew them. You know, we knew what their designs were, and that's how we chose to use them. I got you. So did you have any input? Uh, was it a collaboration in terms of the design or just in terms of the manufacturer? Uh, describe that, that sort of process. Yeah, there. I would say that it was a design. And then in terms of how to manufacture it, that would be something. Certainly with RJ, Les spent a lot of time back and forth with RJ in terms of things that would make it more manufacturable. Uh, Bob Drizola, we would ask him step by step certain design ideas. But mostly the manufacturing, that would have been in-house. Right. Okay. Because that, uh, the RJ Martin, I'm sorry, what's it called? The Machine. Uh, that knife is beautiful, and it looks like an elaborate production to me. Uh, the handle is very, very milled um, and beautiful. It looks like that design in particular must have taken a lot of work. A lot of machining time, for yeah. sure. Those, those, and that's what we're doing with our uh, Neutrons and our other knives now, is that that's going to be an option. I'm not sure if you've seen some of our uh, surface scales for our Atom. We're doing more of that as an, as an option, that we really do like those intricate kinds of, uh, other than just flat slabs, we do a lot of 3D surface machining. That kind of, kind of set, set us apart from a lot of other production knives. And the designs, too, you cut. I know you cut designs into the handles like like the Atom in the Yeah, yeah <laughs> in we the did atom. that on the, on the Neutron. That was just kind of something fun to try. So have you made any fixed blades or have any interest in, in that we market? We made fix, a fixed blade many, many years back, and, and we're just not a fixed blade company, yeah. and we're not going to pursue that. We, we make folders. Well, okay, so as a folder maker, what, what do you consider the pinnacle goal of making a folder? And what I mean is, as, as, as an expert, as someone who's been creating these, uh, these really precise tools... What what is the ultimate goal for you as a company or as a knife? I'm sorry, as as someone trying to perfect a knife, like what would the perfect knife look like? I don't know. I've seen Instagram lately. I think we've been <laughs> throwing a few of them out there. I don't know. We just keep evolving. I think. I mean, at, less every day. I love my Adam. I love my Adam. So we just keep taking that and anything we can learn from that. We just bring that into the next knife in terms of manufacturing. Uh, right now, we feel like we we hit something right there. Something that's just very usable, but elegant and, and lightweight and not threatening to people. And we're just going to, we're going to stay with that. Just get better at it. It looks so, um, precise. I don't know that the, the, the way the whole thing looks just from seeing close-ups and video, uh, now I really have to get one in hand, but they look like they are so dialed in. I don't know how else to say it with the tolerances and with the, and with how the lock, you know, it's, it's all titanium, but there's no stick and all that. I mean, you just seem to have it down. We're trying to get it more and more down because some of the things that maybe have some stick or aren't so dialed in don't end up getting shipped out. So we're, we're really trying to get that down that there, everything that's, we can't, you can't have scrap. You, you can't have a tremendous amount of scrap or you're not going to be making money. So we're getting quite good at that. They are one by one. They are all getting there. And that, it's not like fitting a custom knife. If, you, if you're going to be a manufacturer and your knives have to be fit like a custom knife, then you're not going to last too long. So we're really trying to dial everything in so we can continue to do that. So how does the, uh, how is your titanium business now affected by the boom in your knife business? Well, we really, we still sell some titanium, uh, just the raw material, but that never, 
even though that's the name of the company, we that never really was a, a, a large part of the company. We I just sell small pieces to custom knife makers. We just really changed from custom knife, whatever we called ourselves, to Halfron Titanium just to make it sound stronger. And had really, we didn't sell that much titanium. We do a lot of machining in titanium, and we still do and always will. Um, it will never be called Halpern aluminum. We will never make an aluminum <laughs> knife. Yeah. We will be titanium, carbon fiber. So it really hasn't impacted that part. The custom knife supply part, we actually gave that up about five or six years ago, which has taken a little bit too much time for, for what gain we had. And there's so many other supply companies, and we just said, we're not going to go that route. We're just going to let that go. Well, with the slip joints, uh, you've done three, I think, three slip yes. joints. So uh, you mentioned uh, the European market before. How how are things working for TRM in Europe? It is very popular there, for sure. That's been probably the most popular uh, knife that we have there. But I think we are we also do sell neutrons and atoms around the world. So far, we haven't haven't lost too many. Cedric <laughs> Australia has been a little bit of a problem. Uh, we're about 50-50 getting them through customs. So Really? Uh, they, well, what they, happens to them? They send them back to you or do they uh, just they, put them in their pockets? We're not sure. They kind of sit there for a few weeks and sometimes they come back to us or sometimes they don't go anywhere. But we st- we keep selling it. We're not going to stop for that. We, we have a few issues with, with customs, but it's not worth us saying we're just not going to do it. Right, right. Well, how do you think uh, TRM, how do you plan for it to grow? Is it is it a volume thing? Um, is it a design thing? Tell me what you think the forward path is for TRM. Well, certainly these uh, the atom and the neutron have become our bread and butter models, and we're feeling really good about the nerd, followed by the shadow. And I'll tell you, the new one is going to call it, be called the collusion. You have the to collusion. Say the collusion. So we expect those to be a real core group of knives, and we want to keep making them. And, and keep making our production so we can keep making them all available at some point, or at least you're not waiting for a year to get something, that they'll all be a part of our, our line. And we're going to keep that same AMO, thin, light, good materials, good blades, steel. Um, and there are going to be some variation. They're not all going to be exactly like the neutron and the atom, but we're going to keep that same. It's just a nice knife. I was thinking about uh, the kind of contrast between companies that I admire. Some companies, uh, I'll say like Chris Reeve knives, uh, knives, for instance, they, uh, hit upon a design and they just keep making these amazing knives, but they're very careful about how they roll out the next item, the, the next knife. And, uh, there's something to appreciate in that, that sort of care that goes into really kind of deciding what comes out next. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, Chris Reeve Nice is the uh, the bar in the industry, and we whenever we're compared to them, it's it's like a gr- it's a great honor, and we're hoping that uh, the atom and the neutron are our subventors, and we think there's a pretty good chance that they can be, and we don't need we're not going to rush see how many knives we can get out. We want those to be have a nice solid base and and gradually add other models, but certainly many knife companies have a a few core knives, and they've been making them for thirty years, so. Yeah. We're definitely not a company that's going to make one knife. Nope, you can't get that anymore. Next. I got to say, your design language is very um, universal. It's not trendy. Uh, you know, it's popular now, but it also seems like it could be popular, you know, 15 years hence. Whereas some uh, some companies that I also admire, you know, come out with many models a year or multiple models a year, and they seem to be on trend and it's kind of funny to talk about trends in the knife world, but there are trends everywhere. You know, this one's anodized purple and has a Warncliffe blade. Well, that's not going to last for too long. You know, maybe the Warncliffe blade, but, you know, just this idea of putting out a, something that's um, that's compelling but neutral in terms of, uh, you know, it's not something that looks dated. And then just perfecting it year after year and making it better and better and, and just... Uh, you know, locking in on a model like that or a couple of models. Yeah, that's that's exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, it's kind of a classic look, not old fashioned, but just classic and something that you are proud to carry and show your friends. So, do you go to all the knife shows? Can people find you there and talk to you? So, go to Blade Show. We'll do the New York Custom Knife Show in March. We do the USN, and unfortunately, we just missed the Blade Show West, and we decided that. We're going to go to that next year just because some people out there haven't had a chance. They don't get the blade show. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to do that one next year. I uh, saw a lot of press about it this year. It seems like it's uh, it's gotten uh, – maybe it just wasn't on my radar before, no, but it I, seems I like it's gotten it, much I bigger. I trying to make it, make it uh, something pretty good out there, yes. So how do people uh, get into a Three River Knives, uh, a Three River Manufacturing Knives? How do you how do you find them? How do you buy them? What's the best way for people to uh, to connect with your knives? Well, we we do have a website, ThreeRiversMFG.com, and at this point, a lot of our knives are not available. But what I do is I have a newsletter every two weeks. You have to sign up for our newsletter online, and I give them updates on when a next uh, waiting list is going to be available for the Neutrons and Atoms and the Nerds. And that's the best way to stay in touch if you like to see things as they're going on. Our Facebook group, Tycoons Really Matter, um, is very active, and I do a lot of, uh, I do a fair amount of whining in there, but I do show <laughs> a lot of what's going on behind the scenes. And then Instagram, I certainly post there, and Hillary also is doing some posting just about every day. And we have email, and we have a tycoon at threeriversmfg.com, Hillary at threeriversmfg.com, Jennifer at ThreeRiversMFG.com. Oh, they're all so excited you just gave out their emails. They're oh, oh, they are. Me. They are. <laughs> so, in conclusion, what would be the knife if you told me I had to have a Three Rivers uh, manufacturing knife, a TRM? Which knife would you would you say? I love my Neutron because it's, it's three inches and it's just perfect size for me. Les loves the Atom. It's three and a half inches. So, between either one of those. Because I haven't even carried an atom yet, because I can't give up my neutron. And I, every day, I, I could carry anything I want. I could change the color every hour, but I just can't seem to get rid of my neutron. So I, I'm partial to that, and that's what i got to say about that. So either of those. Well, thank you, Marianne Helper, and thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. It was a pleasure talking to you and finding out more about TRM knives. Well, thank you, Bob. Visit The Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. Back on The Knife Junkie podcast, Jim and Bob here with you and remind you that if you have any thoughts about today's episode, uh, please give us a uh, call on the listener line at 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487. Bob, as we normally do, we kind of give you the the final word and kind of wrap up the interview with a key thought or key takeaway. Well, uh, a common theme on this show and in these interviews, I'm really interested to see how people evolve in their careers and in their uh, in their knife world exploits, because I myself have a mission and I myself would like to have myself fully immersed in that world. So it was really fascinating uh, to hear Marianne kind of uh, detail the evolution uh, that TRM went from supplying items, supplying supplies to knife makers to actually making the knives, you know, after developing relationships with some pretty hot knife makers and uh, kind of being around them the whole time, they sort of figured, well, we could do this too. And, uh, man, it's just really um, inspiring to see see that sort of evolution. So uh, hopefully some of this rubs off. Right. (laughs) Well, I I love the quote, and I think I got it right, the the evolution from parts to the whole knife. I mean, you know, that that kind of shows the... The, tr- the transition there, I guess you will, or the the, the movement along the the line, and you know the the neat thing too is that this is kind of one of those industries where yeah you could go in and you know drop a you know a wad of cash and just you know start off big and doing everything, but I think she said they started with like a two thousand dollar investment, so yeah. it's you know it, it's an industry that that you can get into if you have the desire. Um, it doesn't take a lot of money to to make it happen. Yeah, it just shows that with some hard work, good people, and uh, and and a good nose, you you can make it happen. Thanks so much uh, to you for joining us here on episode number sixty-two of the Knife Junkie Podcast. You can find show notes and actually listen to it and other podcasts if you go to thenifejunkie.com dot com and just do a slash and whatever episode number you want to listen to. So this one is thenifejunkie.com dot com slash sixty-two. You'll find show notes and some other information there and. If you go to thenifejunkie.com slash listen, you'll be able to find all the uh, most recent episodes there if you uh, missed anything. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person, saying thanks so much for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 